Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range. Now, uh, today we're doing the Christmas Q&A and we are about as Christmassy as Ebola <laughs> right now, the pair of us. You're normally very Christmassy though. Yeah, I was. I forgot my hat. I'm <laughs> not Christmassy at all. Um, nor are these questions actually because... Um, but, but let me just interrupt you before we start because we are missing something which I can provide. And that is beer. Oh, excellent. Uh, Herr Braumeister, what, we what have We have a Wiener Lager here. I have a, a beer advent calendar and I'm afraid I'm a bit behind, so you can help. Lightweight! <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And uh, uh, what have you got? I have a forest lager, Überquell, from somewhere German. Hamburg. That's very German. Hamburg. Any more German, you're in the Baltic. <laughs> right, so, Prostly. Proceed. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Right, uh, so the backstory is I asked these questions in the summer thinking, I could do them very quickly, but it would be just me. And then various life-related things got in the way, as usual. And I thought, oh, I'll take them to Finland and I'll do them then. Didn't do it. <laughs> and then and then Chappie here was like, we should do a Christmas Q&A. And I was like, I've got Q&A <laughs> questions from about six months ago. I guess we, we can actually do that then. So um, here we are. Right. So the first one is Fred. Uh, Mike, you need to finish the Smith Rubin and Carl 31 <laughs> series before I die, which in the current global climate could be any day. Much to nobody's chagrin. So the question is, in quasi-Victorian style, will it be done? Yes. The short answer. The long answer <laughs> is, I don't know when. Uh, it will. Uh, the longer, longer answer is there are adv advantages to such tidiness, because in the meantime, we've turned up all sorts of interesting information and we can actually answer yep. various questions much more thoroughly, like what's the deal with 230 versus 270 millimeters? We have the uh, millimeter rifling twist. We have the definitive answer on that. There's all sorts of funky stuff about tests with clip-on front sights uh, due to uh, observer experience in the First World War, because the lowest sight setting is... Um, is 300 meters, and it's 300 meters Schwarzsex, so with a six o'clock hold. Um, we can now answer that question as to how, they're, how they were originally supposed to be sighted, because the 19, it turns out the 1916 manual was wrong, and we know specifically that, this, that the manual was wrong, because in the document it says, but it's the 1916 wrong. manual <laughs> says, um, was this, uh, but it's wrong. Was this some of Dale's digging, um, in, coincidentally? Some of it was. Yeah. Some of it was just Dale putting me onto a resource where there was a big data dump of mm. stuff. He's the ultimate resource rat. Yes. Um, <laughs> and also we can rewrite um, the story about when they dropped the idea of having three different rifles. Because originally it was going to be a long rifle, a short rifle, and a carbine, <laughs> which is the same length as the short rifle. Um, and actually it wasn't until spring 1914 when they finally decided that they were going to, that it was pointless to have a distinction between carbine and, uh, and short rifle, where it's basically minor differences, but it's the same overall length. Um, it would, we previously believed from the literature that it was a decision taken at the end of the 1908-1909 trials, uh, but it wasn't. It was actually relatively late. Mm. And one of the really, really uber nerdy things that came out of that was uh, it meant they couldn't recycle uh, short rifle slings from the 1900 short rifle, so they had to indent for a credit for however many tens of thousands of, uh, of Car 11 slings <laughs> at three francs each. So we can, we will nerd out on this, but uh, so it is a non trivial episode. The next one, yeah, it's not just it's <laughs> it's rather more than just synthesizing what's in Grenacher and yeah. the Grudzer book. It's it's a bit more involved than that, but it will have all sorts of new inf new information that is currently only in written form in the archives and on my hard drive. <laughs> if I die, I delete my hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Next up, Tim asks: In the main, rifle grenades have gone the way of the dodo. Does their disappearance have more to do with five point five six not having the oomph to chuck a decent payload at a respectable distance, or is there more to it than that? You're French, so. Well, I think um, with the FAMAS, they continued using rifle grenades for quite a while, so there's no power issue with the five five six. Uh, it's more that with all the other new launchers around, why bother? It's always a relatively brutal experience firing it they're nasty <laughs> they're, they're, they're pretty nasty to use and um, basically mm -hmm. everyone's gone to under slung grenade launchers yep. for a reason and uh modern armor 
is beyond the capabilities of most rifle grenades. I mean, the whole, if you remember the whole Stronger 57 deal is to launch these more than one kilo great big things to penetrate 60 centimetres of Soviet armour, I think it was, off the top of my head. Uh, the little 5.56.1 standard, sort of, like what everyone else, what everyone <laughs> else was, was using other than the Swiss with the crazy Runkula. Um, so, armour penetration, you can't really, you can't really defeat it anymore. Yeah. The greater proliferation of anti-armour weapons down to a fairly low level, sort of both throwaways and reusable, sort of Panzerfaust and Charlie G and various other more modern incarnations of that sort of thing. Um, they are, rifle grenades are very large and space inefficient to throw an amount of high explosive that isn't going to do a lot anymore. Worth, yeah. yeah, I mean, even in an anti personnel role, so just a high, ex high explosive one, you're not getting much. A hugely greater payload. I mean, you are getting a bigger payload than a, than a 40 mil, but you can have so many more 40 mils and <laughs> shoot them far more accurately and far less painfully. Yeah. Um, and it's literally only the French that have... Well, they held on the long, longest, but now, now it's, it's over. Part, it's part of their 416 <laughs> program is ability to launch rifle grenades. It's still, mm. it's still part of the French design package. Um, I'm not they're sure. Not like, issuing they're it not in, issuing it. They're not issuing it. They're not... The, the, the HK... 416s are not, they're not firing. They're even um, listening to people who went through the last phases of uh, st starting service with the FAMAS, they didn't even, they didn't fire rifle grenades anymore. I mean, it used to be a sort of hazing thing to shoot, oh, yeah. them, shoot them from the shoulders. There's loads of hazing videos on YouTube. Go on, try this out. Ha ha ha. Because they weren't meant to be. The, the, <laughs> I mean, that's what the funny, the funny flip out sight on the side is. That you're meant to put the butt on the deck mm -hmm. and use this funny... Well, there is in there is direct shoulder fire as well. They have the sights for them. Yeah, but most of the time, yes, you're supposed to put it at compared 40, to, forty-five degree ish, thirty-five degree. Yeah, fire it that. But way. compared to a an underslung grenade launcher that just goes. Oh yeah, it's hor it's horrible. Yeah, absolutely horrible. <laughs> Colin asks, it would be good if you could provide a list of places in Switzerland <laughs> or Europe that we can get spares for Swiss rifles. Getting them from the USA is not good. A uh, list of places. Um, Google is your friend. Yeah, I'm afraid in Switzerland there's no parts shop. You just go to any any reasonable gun shop, and they will have the gun. Sh the gun shows are, are yeah, better shows for specific are parts. Yep. If you go to a normal gun shop for for most parts, you're paying through the nose anyway because it's a mm. gun shop. The sellers at um, um, at gun shows, some of them have like. like Oh, yeah, draws, yeah. Back to Vettelis and and the average gun shop might have some K thirty one parts, but apart from that, yeah, yeah. But it's like they wanted last last time I looked, I won't name names, but they wanted <laughs> um, eighty francs for a K thirty one cocky handle assembly. Ooh, yeah. It was like <laughs> nah, the gun show they're twenty. <laughs> yeah, in Germany they're twenty. Mm. Bog off. Yeah, I think um, Germany is a far better source. For an individual sort of go-to shop for gun parts. Uh, the problem is in both in both cases you you need a tame tame local. Yeah, to get it. Because a lot of them won't ship won't ship to foreign. And then you have to dis you have to find out which parts are restricted in which countries, which mm -hmm. are considered mm -hmm. essential components, which are not. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Fre Fred mentions Kessler, mm. GunFactory.ch. Yeah. Um, and things like that, but. Um, uh, please don't ask us to sort you parts. Source you parts. We 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 can't. We won't. Sorry, sorry. It's just it just ends up being a bottomless pit of sourcing low value parts for very little money and, <laughs> and a lot of time. A lot of time. <laughs> sorry, we just we draw the line. We, we we don't source parts. Max asks, was there any type of special tooling needed to cut the bolt lug raceways and locking surfaces inside Schmidt Rubin eighteen eighty nine and eighteen ninety six receivers? Yes. <laughs> the answer, the, the short answer is, oh yes. The long answer is, they had a very different idea of production engineering back in the day. These days, because labor is expensive and tooling is relatively cheap, and machine time is relatively cheap, we tend to CNC the crap out of everything. Yep. And, we, and people will design stuff for CNC machining so that it can be made uh, with as little specialist tooling as possible, as much off the shelf, as much standard cuts, as much standard... Tooling you can just buy. As many operations on one tool. Yeah, and rotary tooling, not single point cutters. It's like if you're resorting to a single point cutter, 
you've probably done something wrong. And that's something in the, in the, in the, in the cam rifle, mm. the BMS cam rifle is like, there's this huge raceway down the receiver that's just this huge single point cut yeah, they've gone raceway. Again, again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally unnecessary. There was an infinitely simpler way of doing that, but I guess he had a single point cutter, a shaper, and just used it. Yeah. Um, the way they did it back in the day was they pretty much worked out what they wanted and then thought, how the crap do we make this? Um, and the gun factories at the time basically were banks and banks and banks and banks and banks of specialist machines built to make one or two or three however many specific cuts yep. in the right order. Um, One guy trained on that yeah. tool and would be doing that And would, all would do that all day. And it was, <laughs> it was kind of semi-skilled. And all he had to do was identify when, it, when the tool wasn't cutting properly and call a tool setter, who was the expert, mm. more highly paid, and would, would be running around resetting machines and saying, oh, nah, it's it's all, new tool gauges. screwed, new, yeah. new tool. Um, it, it, was a, it was a very different way of doing things. So all those raceways, it's the same on a, on a Lee Enfield action, that, that raceway for the small lug, you cannot CNC that with rotary, rotary tools. You literally can't get a tool in there to do it. It's a, it's a specialist. I mean, they sort of get something in to do part of it, just to, to, to rough out the middle. Mm. And then if you, look at, if you look at the machining marks on it, uh, it, seems to, it seems to have been a, a specialist single point cutter that's, that's dragged just gone in and yeah. dragged it out. <laughs> um, and that's the way they, they did it back then because they could have all these machines and the machines of course were, were expensive, everything was expensive, but the labor was cheap. So you can have a zillion people, whereas now you want to, you want to set something up so that you, you put in a billet or a, or a forging of the right size and someone, get, someone pulls down the cover and presses go. Yeah, it's a button pusher. And half an hour later comes back and, <laughs> and swaps it out. And yeah. now one person can do that on a load of CNC machines. Mm. And it's, uh, it's the way we do it now. Um, not going to go on a tangent with uh, rear locking on that as well. No, next question, go, stop. Right. <laughs> Duncan asks, taking Swiss terrain and climate into account, how good slash bad were slash are issued Swiss military footwear? I think there are no worse than anybody else. Um, the terrain applies to other countries as well. They're not the only mountainous country. They're, they're quite big on resoling the standard boots. Yeah, I mean, now the, the latest ones are uh, Hakes boots, which the French have got, the Dutch have got. Uh, I think everybody's essentially, so continental Europe have gone over to those. But before they had indeed these boots with these huge rubber he uh, soles, which they they just they have a knife and just cut off. I think Pas I think Pascal was telling us that yeah. that like the the initial soles they just expect them to wear out really really quickly yeah, and then slice the it off like a slice of cheese, glue on a new a new layer and uh, off you go. Mm. So it's a, it's an interesting way they instead of having a something that's supposed to last a long time, it's just to have a sacrificial soul. My soul is definitely sacrificial. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, and then back in the day with the Nagali Shua, um, they were super heavy, but super mm. robust. And actually comfortable, as I found out during our brief winter brutality, because I, I was wearing a pair of Negley. Swiss Negley? Yep. Okay. Because, of again, it's the French mountain boots were identical for obvious reasons. Mm. Uh, big, thick leather sole, which once, when you put them on in the morning, it's tough. But then once your body heat... Once it's warmed up. And warmed okay. up, it's actually really, really comfortable. Okay. But yeah, I wouldn't want to walk hike miles, and that's for sure. A um, couple of years ago, I got plantar, so I don't take any yeah. plantar fasciitis. So I don't take any risks with my with my feet anymore. I don't even I don't even walk around the house barefoot. That's how seriously I take it. Okay. Anyway, Roy asks, I did not buy a Model 1911 or a K31 right before the ammo garden in the US. Only two boxes of 7.5 available that was readily available. How much am I going to regret that decision? Yes. You always regret buying a gun. It's just standard. Yep. <laughs> well, not buying yep. a gun, sorry. Yep. Just <laughs> buy, buy it. Um, oh, this one's a bit dated. Luke asks, what projects and trips do you and the chap have planned for 2021? Um, well, we well, could maybe just project. Um, well, let's just do a little recap. I mean, 
2021, we did Replacement Brutality. We went to war yep. in February. Um, we both did Finish Brutality. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I did Desert Brutality. Yep. Awful lot of fun. And then next year, uh, if life permits, I'm hoping to do um, um, Woodland Brutality in Virginia with Les of nice. um, Polaris Worldwide mm-hmm. Logistics. Finish Brutality, Desert Brutality, and then some SRA stuff because now I've now I've got the hang of going back and forth with Finland um, it's literally just a question of, of Patreon and ad revenue budget mm-hmm. um, and I reckon I reckon that if the match is within an hour of Helsinki I reckon I could fly out on a Friday afternoon get the Friday afternoon flight from Zurich shoot a match on Saturday Long drink and sauna in the evening. <laughs> be back, and I'll be. Ba- I could be back home on Sunday. Time for evening. kippers. <laughs> Smoke me a kipper. I'll be back for breakfast. Yes. Yeah. God, that dates us. <laughs> um, I reckon that's entirely possible. Yeah. I should um, probably limit myself to finish. Mm-hmm. I enjoy the brutalities, but it's your thing. <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, on my side of things, I have some nice ammo projects for my muzzle loaders. Uh, probably well, was a question later. Probably with some more collabs, um, continuing the Mad Minute Black Powder series, which for some reason people <laughs> have picked up and like it. Yeah. So um, I can't own everything, nor can anybody else. So it's it's an opportunity to link up with other channels to you know to have them try out the rifles that they have that I don't, uh, and so on. So that's mm. that's an interesting project that's just sort of grown. Um, oh yeah, other other projects. I mean, get back into doing the historic stuff. I mean, just by the force <laughs> of how things have panned out in the last couple of years, you've been doing more of the historic side, and yeah. I've been doing more of the sport shooting side, which is fine. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's the way. That's that's just the way it's. It's evolved. It's evolved. It's evolving, um, right? What we've both had time, energy, and inclination for, because this this is a hobby. It is not a day job. It sometimes occupies an <laughs> unhealthy middle ground between the two. Um, but we do stuff we're interested in at any given moment. Um, that's and that's and that's how it is. It's uh, If it ever turned into a day job, it would possibly be a different matter. Mm. But um, <clears throat> you know, it would have to get very, very, very much more generous than me <laughs> to do that, I'm afraid. Uh, next up, Matthew asks... Have the Swiss ever actually adopted a foreign-designed firearm for a major role? Lots, actually. I yeah. just, there's one I've forgotten in the list here. Mm-hmm. So let's try and take these in in um, date order. Or date yeah. order. So yeah. the first one's the Maxim. In the late 19th century, the Swiss adopted the Maxim machine gun. Oh. We'll, stay, we'll stick to, to breech loaders, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, there's all the... Back in, back in your smoke pole era, there was... There, there was, was a lot of foreign... Mm-hmm. <laughs> for foreign, but, anyway. um, but how much of that actually dates from when it was a federal army well actually the most of let's say 50 51 because the thing is the, a lot of the initial federal muzzle loaders were belgium made they just ordered from the edge mm-hmm. so uh, quite a lot of it is hong cut mm-hmm. um and then then you get the batch of peabody's it's only really in Vetterly where they say, no, we want Swiss. And then... That was, kind of the, that was kind of the era of not necessarily firearms nationalism, but firearms manufacture nationalism. Yeah. But it was also a ploy to uh, boost um, employment and skilled labour. Because okay. it was, you know, we can use this opportunity to train up and develop mm-hmm. the technical uh, engineering mm-hmm. things. But, uh, but yeah, but anyway. to the British loaders. First up, Maxim machine gun. The big... Mm-hmm. Obvious one. Yep. Uh, the Parabellum pistol, aka Luger. Yes. That was a, a big one. Uh, from then on, I mean, actually, if we just wind back up all the various Schmidt and other design revolvers, there, they're, they're kind of based on foreign stuff, but mm. then Schmittified. <laughs> and they're, they're <laughs> Dabbled. Yeah. Uh, and then we're we're all sort of big gap until Cold. Big end of Cold War gap. And then we've got the uh, Browning M2, 
heavy machine gun Minimi was adopted as the LMG 05. Uh, and then nowadays the, the pistols, there's an awful lot of foreign pistols, Glock 17s. Yep. For instance, the uh, military police have Glock 17s, Gen 4, I believe. Yes. Um, and then there's all sorts of Sig Sauer, Sig Pro, Sig Sauer. Is it German? Is it Swiss? Is it? Yeah, the, the pistols is now just. It's just, it's just expanded, expanded into, into whatever you, whatever your particular service requires. Yeah, yeah, um, and I'm sure there's probably others that we're forgetting in more specialist roles, but that's the basic stuff an infantryman might come into contact with. Yeah. Uh, Brandon's mum asks, "You guys ever shoot trap slash skeet slash sporting clays?" A very very long time ago at a scout camp. <laughs> um, I think in my entire time in Switzerland, I've shot it once. Um, it's not a big thing here. It's a big thing in the UK because mm -hmm. of the licensing regime, because you have an absolute right to have a shotgun certificate, um, which not every police force actually understands. But you have an absolute, if you've got no criminal record and you can store the gun safely, you have an absolute right to a shotgun certificate. There's no good, uh, good need requirement, which is partly why it's huge and it's relatively easy to shoot shotgun over land over which you've got permission. Yeah. Um, here, the, the, it's specialised ranges, it's, it's expensive and it's not a big thing. Yeah, there's just no history of no. doing it. Helping out Othias of seeing Arsenal with the clay throwers things and only one has turned up in Switzerland. Did you hear that one that I found? That no. wooden thing with the printed instru paper oh. instructions. I don't know what became of that. Hmm. Chase up. Um... Dan, Dan Echo. That's a nice name. I like that. <laughs> How do you think firearms design would have developed if smokeless powder had never been invented? I'll discuss that. It, it, if it progressed to semi-automatic or fully automatic, you'd be stuck with... Well, it did. I mean, it did. The, well, the early yeah, Maxims. The early ones did, yeah. I mean, the Brits, the Brits adopted Maxims in 577-450 Martini Henry, which must, must have just been absolutely <laughs> incredible to see firing. Because yeah. that's, that's one of the chunkiest black powder cartridges that, uh, that came out. <laughs> that wasn't specialist long-range target shooting. It, mm. was, it, was, it was huge, and these huge, great heavy belts. But you, you, but you could just forget any gas-operated system. <laughs> yeah, it would, it would certainly fail too much. Um, so if... Chemically, smokeless powder wasn't possible. Um, recoil operation would have been the, the the name of the game. Yep. Simply because it minim it minimizes the amount of fouling. Uh, yeah, that's that's basically it. Or you or mechanically driven systems. Perhaps perhaps people <laughs> would have paid a lot more attention to electrics and, yeah. uh, in guns at an earlier stage. But then you got the problem of water. And and other and other things, mm. but um, yeah, we we wouldn't we wouldn't be a uh, uh, gas pressure dominated. Absolutely, um, steampunk would prevail. Very much. <laughs> I think that's I think that's it. I think I suspect that the semi-automatic pistol would look roughly the same. Yeah, because I mean, certainly 1911s run. You can run them on black powder. Yeah, they run absolutely. Yeah. Um, calibers would be larger. Yep. Because of the the, the 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 maximum muzzle velocity you can get out of black powder is way down. I guess they would probably still stay around forty five. Anyway. Yeah, I think so. You know, there's some you know, fifty cal, maybe. Yeah, although it's, otherwise saying, it gets also silly. They're saying that the last the last gen black powder rifle cartridges. I mean, the last one was intent actually intended as a as a black powder. I guess was eight mil cropper check, and that was and that yeah. was an FMJ. Um, that was a nine nine point five. The Turkish. The Turkish one is cartridge. possibly the optimal. Yeah. Um, black powder cartridge. Was that jacketed or was that? I don't know. Mm. Uh, can't not mention three hundred three Mark One. Although that was just <laughs> a, that was just a stop gap. It was always intended to be nitro. It was just we want to get these rifles out in the field as quickly as possible. So uh, tangent. They uh, they actually scaled the rear sight for a theoretical smokeless cartridge that didn't exist. And then got them out in the field and had because it was it was the era of colonial warfare at long distances out out in the felt and in the dusty sandy places of the world and uh, it made a difference. 
So they they replaced the sliders with ones calibrated to the actual cartridge. <laughs> so we actually need to use these to hit people. Yeah. Oops. And then a couple of years later, went smokeless and had to <laughs> do it all over again. Okay. Christian asks, if you and Chappie were able to, by some miracle, bring all of your toys, including the Dakers, would it be worth using moving to the US? Probably not. At this stage in life, anyway. Mm. Um, for running the channel, yes. <laughs> for everything else, no. Yeah. I don't think so. Easy it's, access to guns, etc., ranges. Yeah. Sure. Given what the pair of us do in the day job, don't think I'd want to do <laughs> either of our jobs in the US. No. No. Much, uh, much better conditions for doing it here. Clayton asks, any plans for another collab with Rob of British Muzzle Loaders? OMG, yes. In fact, there's already been one this yeah, year. Yeah, <laughs> there has, there has. Um, and once, once things get back to vaguely normal, uh, I'm going to occupy the same space time as Rob and hopefully Athias as well. That's mm -hmm. I didn't mention that because uh, uh, earlier because I, I don't know if that's going to come off this yeah. year. We'll see. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a question of time and budget. Yeah, because I have a. We did the Mad Minute, <clears throat> the Martini Mad Minute, with Rob this year, and we have another project next year, also on the uh, on another rifle, not in the Mad Minute series, but a, a true mm -hmm. comparison collab. Yeah, but remote. One for me. Do you want to read it? One for you, Dan G. Says, are the Enfield magazines of the same type? Number four, number five magazines, interchangeable without hand fitting. Do you want a little explanation? Go a little it. explanation. I know that magazines of different types uh, will not interchange due to differences in magazine design. I've seen some posts on firearm blogs about Lee Enfield magazines always needing a hand fit, always needing hand fitting to swap between rifles. I suspect this is FUD law, and I don't recall Skeneton mentioning this in his books. Uh, yeah, it's FUD law. Um... They often interchange within the same type of magazine, but not always. Um, and they may require a little bit of hand fitting, typically fiddling the lips. Uh, they may do. I mean, I got a bunch that just worked. A bunch of spare ones I picked up when they turned up for not a lot of money. And I think they all work in my long branch. Mm -hmm. um, I think... I'm pretty sure the mags between my SMLEs swap because I've got I've got the Enfield 1918 and the Ishapur 1945, and I'm pretty sure they just drop into each other, uh, despite being on different continents and from different eras. Um, yeah, it's just it's one of those it depends questions, and I've got uh, Fred saying, I believe he's Australian. Uh, SMLE mags will tend to interchange much more easily um, but it, it depends on the individual pair of pair of rifles and their and their condition and part of uh, part of the issue is if you're if because the trigger guard is uh, is hinged and supports the magazine it can if, if, if you would shrunk it might be a bit fiddly but try it and see basically most of them most of them seem to be all right Dave asks, a friend recently tried to purchase a hard-to-source repl uh, hard replacement grip screw for his French 32 unique Kriegs Model 17 from a seller in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Excuse my. <laughs> he was politely informed that recent changes to New Zealand firearms law made the export of any type of gun-related part or accessory from there a practical impossibility. How much local red tape or outright prohibition does an individual living in Switzerland currently face when ordering firearms slash ammunition related parts, accessories, tools or supplies from other countries? By the way, you wouldn't happen to know of a good source for old unique parts. <laughs> unique parts. <laughs> uh, well, it depends if it's a controlled item or not. If it's yeah. a controlled item, it needs an input permit. We have a de defined list of what is and isn't. Yeah. I mean, in the primary legislation, there's... There's the uh, Wesentlicher Bestandteil, and those mm -hmm. are listed yep. in the regulations. Uh, there's the Besonders Konstruierte Bestandteil, Waffenbestandteil, the specially constructed 
foreign component. Nobody knows what the crap is that is. Nobody cares. <laughs> Nor do they. Nor do they. <laughs> There's no list. Basically, the in practice, the rule is, um, as long as it's not one of the one of the um, uh, main components, facing click of Um and it's not part of something that's that falls under under the very naughty list, like silencer parts or certain machine gun parts. Um, nobody cares. Yeah. And the simplest thing you do is if you if you're not sure, you send an email to FedPol. It's a specific email address, and you normally get a reply within the day or the day after. Yeah. Very and he'll give you a, a standard answer. And the problem is that customs often don't know. <laughs> yes. So what I tend to do, if I'm ordering anything that looks a bit like a gun part, I've either got an email already that I can just print out a copy of, or I ask. And then uh, if there's a question with customs, because they can get quite aggressive, mm. um, I just send them a copy and say, look, FedPol says this is good. And, yep. and they, accept, they accept what FedPol say, luckily. Yeah, it's it's a good collaboration with football. Yeah, um, any ammunition components. Yes. Are import permit requiring yeah. magazines? They don't care, regardless. Even of, the large magazines, yeah. <laughs> even actually. the naughty magazines, they can just import them. Yeah, um, <laughs> there is no, there is no. When, when they did the the updated firearms law, they didn't change the customs part of it mm. regarding them. So any magazine can be imported. The thing is. Um, You've not committed a customs offence, so customs don't care. But if you don't have the right to acquire that new magazine, so you don't already own something it fits into, yeah. uh, you've actually committed an offence. But that's on you. But that's on you. But <laughs> customs won't care because as far as customs are concerned, magazines are... It's, it, they're, they're not there to enforce firearms law, they're there to enforce customs law. Mm. Some of the customs law... So this rabbit hole stuff. Some of the customs law is in the firearms law, but the bits of the firearms law that don't pertain to customs, customs don't care about. Yeah. So I've never had a question when, bring, when having a large magazine sent to me. Yeah. I've had a couple of questions of <laughs> when they sometimes buy the muzzle loaders from France or Germany or whatever. Yeah. And so they just have, what is this letter that comes to me? Yeah. And usually I've got a book source. I take a picture of the picture of the front cover of the book and the page and send it to them and then mm. okay fine so then they just within the within the day you get a response and they just liberate the the package and yeah. off it goes um someone uh in one of the clubs we're both a member of um got pinged ordering muzzle loading bullets rambles rambles yeah from germany that's that's an ammunition component and before you say yes but diving weight shot <laughs> yeah, yeah yes but diving <laughs> weight shot you're right absolutely you're 100 percent correct Oops. It, uh, how do you tell it from 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 a diving weight shot? Well, it was probably in a box from H and N or something. Probably, yeah. mark, clearly marked as <laughs> muzzle loading bullets. Um, that's the difference. Mm. Although that, that was tiny, new, right? that was a new that was a new one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you've got to deal with the export restrictions from mm. from other countries. Um, and the thing is, also, if you do get pinged for something, they do give you a chance to acquire the license. Yes, but what you don't do is you don't say, <laughs> oh, in that case, I won't bother. Yeah, because no, no. they, they will chase you. Because then you have commission defence because you you tried to import something illegally. Yeah. Whereas if you say, fine, give me time to acquire a licence and then mm -hmm. carry on, then they're, they're good. Yeah. I think basically it, it's, it's that you've got a chance to fi prove file, the, prove file the you're paper. To have in it. principle, yeah. you're supposed to have had the paperwork already, yeah. but the paperwork comes through so quickly. Mm. I presume they give you a month or something to reply yeah, in a permit. Normally, like if, you, if you already have your uh, your, your uh, stuff, house talk, because that can sometimes Criminal take a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. If you have everything ready, you, in two weeks you usually have. Yeah, it. if it's an ammo, if it's ammunition component, it's just it's just an import permit. If it's <laughs> if it's a firearms component, you shouldn't have been doing it in the first place <laughs> yeah. without having the paperwork already in place. So don't. Yeah. So old unique parts. Probably, obviously, France, uh, or even Germany, um, especially for the unique. It's also used by the Wehrmacht. So, uh, but frankly, a, a grip screw, just get someone to make one. I'm sure, I'm sure you've got the rest. You've got the other one. Mm. So just get someone to make one. It's not a numbered part or, or anything. Mm. 
Phil asks, we all know you love your British military rifles for their fast actions, but have you ever tried the Winchester 8095s in whatever calibre you can get one, preferably Russian contract version, and seen how fast it is? Um, I haven't actually had the pleasure of a 95. I would love one of those. Yeah, me too. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was a there was a sporterized um, 1895 and 303 British, because I believe there were some units that private purchased their rifles. Really? Um, and I believe there were some cavalry formations. Okay. Um, I'm expecting some kind of hunting yeah, setup. Yeah, because there, there were ones in musket configuration, so mm. full, full yeah, of yeah. stock and bayonet lug in 303. Oh, in 303, okay. In 303, mm. to, my, to my knowledge. And if I'm wrong, someone can correct me <laughs> in the comments, but I'm pretty sure I remember reading about that or seeing it, and this one had clearly been cut down. But uh, it's sort of the era of the, the yeomanry where a local... Mm. Local... Richie much rich face dignitary would uh, sponsor a local regiment yeah. and would uh, be expected to pay for the uniforms Sign and the, the equipment. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, see how fast it is. I mean, it's still a long. It's a long sway. throw. Yeah. They're a long throw. Um, I think people's perception of the speed of lever actions is clouded by modern cowboy action with. <laughs> light short throw, light springs, mm. light loads, and people going <laughs> on huge targets at really close range. <laughs> um, I think in practical Mad Minute style, certainly in the prone position, uh, which is the default for military <laughs> rifle shooting, once we are beyond the, the, the fighting in lines yeah. thing, um, it's a lot of movement compared to a fast bolt. You have to twist it yeah, every time. No. No, no. Would you still no. be able to do it prone? Yeah, you do, yeah. You do a prone. But you, you've got to you've got to push your elbow yeah. elbow forward to 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 do it. Mm. Probably, um, yeah. They're more complicated. They're more they're more fiddly. Self disemboweling guns. Like. Self disemboweling guns. Yeah, you just open, especially the ninety five. Just open it. Everything just yeah. Like, rah, rah. <laughs> mm. So turbo eighteen eighty nine. Ask, do any of the Swiss designed and used firearms have specific features for extreme cold weather freeze up mitigation? Swiss high, mount, Swiss high mountain use. Similar to such features included in the Arctic Warfare British sniper rifle. Somebody, probably Jan. <laughs> more qualified than well, us. Well, it will yeah. be more qualified than us. And with a 57, it'll be Dale who will be more qualified than us. I, we, we discussed this beforehand and we can't put our finger on a specific feature like the, the ice breaking grooves and the bolt of the. Um, Accuracy International or the V modification to the back of the trigger the icebreaker trigger on yeah. the L85 Bolt accelerator and Lati pistols things like that yeah I mean they were obviously tested mm. at high altitude um, back in the day it's probably still online somewhere there was a like test report of the Stungwehr 90 where they they had some up at the Jungfrau Joch um, in the in the high Alps, and it's very cold up there. Left them out, <laughs> covered in ice, and then shot them down the glacier and and stuff like that. So they were they they were clearly very concerned about performance. But I can't think of any particular adaptation. But there might be. Yeah, if you know, please let us know because we can increase the total sum of human knowledge together. Um. Robert asks, if you were offered an expenses paid trip for one day of access to any shooting facility or museum in the world, what would you pick? I'd probably pick the same as you because they probably have, they have a worldwide yeah, it's, it's, collection. It's the, um, what was the pattern room collection, which is now the Royal Armouries in Leeds. Mm. I would like to actually time travel back to when it was <laughs> the pattern room and Herb Woodend was around. Yeah, because of their notion of we'll get a sample of everything from everywhere. To have one and study, mm -hmm. which is a, a really and they got all sorts of tra amazing. trains yeah. of prototypes of yeah. obscure stuff. It's really, it's it's really cool. Um, Guido asks plans in the near future, twenty twenty maybe, to do that bloke on the range bolt gun match again. Uh, ideally, something similar mm -hmm. uh, within the bounds of the range, range of yeah. availability and what we can do. Uh, we were going to do sort of adapted civilian service rifle type thing last year, but uh, COVID restrictions got in yeah, the way. Maybe expand to non-bolt action. Yeah. Within within reason. You have to set a limit somewhere. You're not going to let me shoot my bolt with stoner, do you? 
But if you create a, if you somehow create a category that it somehow falls into, <laughs> you know, toy guns or something. Guns with <laughs> pink slings from Trunk Monkey. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we'll we'll would love to do something similar. Yeah. Um, we're waiting for the building work on the range to finish. Uh, we won't be able to do 100, 200, 300 delayed. like we did, but yeah, that's been case. delayed. Yeah. But we should have a lot of possibilities at 100 mm. and closer. Well, that's going to be 20, uh, 2023. Yeah, it's, it's just it was going to be done this winter, but now it's not. Yeah. So we shall see. And the problem, the problem with doing something just at 300 is a lot of people will not get on the target. <laughs> Because yeah. their their rifles aren't zero, and they're very 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 sensitive about people not being able to hit the target. At yeah, 300. that's a lot of the sensitivity regarding non-Swiss firearms. This is, is damage to the range. Yeah, is is people not getting on target? There's all sorts of there's all sorts of fuddisms about it, like uh, like oh, you can't guarantee that a that a foreign gun is matching serial numbers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which was a reason why you couldn't shoot foreign mark. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of boomerisms like that. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and just because so, this is going to appear in the questions, um, we have no plans for the moment of doing a brutality type event because we have nowhere to hold it. And until we do, we're not even going to try. Yeah, it's like every time anyone asks us, and people do, uh, it's get, me a, get us a range. There, I have discovered several places where in principle if we could get on it if we could get the permission to do it mm. the range is physically suitable to do it it's getting the permission to do it getting the range time to do it and we probably won't get permission to film yeah because there's a general prohibition on filming and photography on military ranges because it's, it's going to be 99 percent a military facility yeah and then there's a question <laughs> and then there's a question of foreigners attending and that I mean, sorry, non-residents <laughs> attending. Uh, and that adds an extra layer of, of complexity. Mm. Um, loaning is also non-trivial. Loaning? As in loaner guns. Well, provided someone's there, it's fine. Yeah. If the owner's there. It's um, but there's, there's, there's a lot of hills to climb there. Um, the first step is, if someone gets us a range, we can, we can do it. And we would still do it even if it was restricted to only people resident in Switzerland and no filming because mm. it's cool. It's and awesome. it would, we, and people would come. And people would come. We would yeah. fill it. Mm. There would be, we would advertise it, we would fill it, and that would be great. The ideal case would be we get a cool range like Hirol, which is literally just over the back there. Um, we get permission to film, we get permission to bring at least the sort of, the sort of, the gang. <laughs> Get Ian and Carl and Les and Yari and mm-hmm. Jenny. Polinar. And, the Polinar crew. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, Polinar and just just have a core uh, and film it. But I think that's pie in the sky. Maybe mm. maybe we'll be able to do something on a small scale with just Swiss residents and no filming. Just as a starter. Just try and See what we can do long term. Build it up. Build, build confidence up with the authorities, the range owners. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, but chances of this coming to fruition are actually kind of slim. Mm. Unfortunately. Yeah, no, it's just it's it's just the way it is. Uh, there are rumours of an indoor facility being built that might be possible. It would be big enough to run it. Did you know? No, right? I, no? Um, no, I can't remember. I think it was. It was Lo Amental or Ober Argal. They were renovating a sports center okay. and they were going to make in the basement a bunch of basically fairly Cardi long boxes. Cardi boxes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I mean, we could do a Casada drill with a, with a sandbag, with a sand sack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you can't damage, don't want to damage the floor with a kettlebell. That would be an arse. It would be an absolute <laughs> arse. That, that's, that's not going to, certainly the one we'll get won't roll. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So then it just goes flop onto the floor and make it totally brutal. But the distances will be fairly short. Mm. So the physical side of it would have to be pretty Pretty harder harder to make up for it. But that would be a private facility. So we could, provided we could get it, we could film. Wouldn't be a problem with people wearing camo, things like that. Uh, But yes, we would love to at the moment, not likely. 
but we will try if someone gets us a range. <laughs> so, if you know of a range, if you have... Actually, <laughs> genuinely know of a range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a lot of promises. There's a lot of... Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and Pascal's working on something. Yeah. So that's a possibility. It's just... Until, until this becomes more something more than just a possibility, it's, it's like... Yeah, we're, yes, not, we're not going to invest the time and effort if we don't even have anywhere to go. Yeah, we can't, we can't go beyond planning it until we have a location. That's it. Craig. No, but Timothy. Timothy. Have you read Roger Wadham's The 2012 Complete Book on the Enfield Accurizing? And if so, what are your thoughts on this treatise? Or if not, would you like me to send you a copy to support the channel? Ah. A very kind offer. Uh, the answer is I've seen excerpts from it. Um, it's not really within my field of interest in general because I'm interested in the military way of doing it and the busy way of accurizing for service rifle B. Um, beyond that, anything anything not compatible with with that is then not spirit of the original, so it doesn't really fall into my area of interest. I would very much like a copy, however. Uh, that was a very generous offer, so please uh, send me a message and we'll work out how to do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, the sort of modern glass bedding and modern fiddling is sort of outside the scope of interest, and, and is it really? <laughs> there you say it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Craig. On the back of the cart with nine hole reviews, what impact do you think there would have been on the Falklands campaign if the UK had managed to get the L85 into service with all its faults by 1982? And the answer is none whatsoever. Don't think um, it was a was not a rifle dominated campaign. The mm. rifles worked well enough uh, in that environment. It's just grey and soggy. Yeah. Uh, there's no there's no major sand or dust or mud issues particularly uh i think the rifles would have worked well enough i mean contrary to popular belief the slr is not reliable by modern standards mm. i mean foul fouls are early 50s designs then they're not as reliable as a modern ar um but i don't think it would have it would have changed anything positively or negatively to be honest, um, maybe on, on some small scale actions, the, the presence of a not quite so tragically bad four power scope and everyone <laughs> having one, yeah. uh, rather than a few guys having the tragic suit sight. What about compactness? It's open feet. It's open. Yeah. Very little. More land, basically. Urban action. It's more land. It's, yeah. I don't, I don't think it would have. Craggy, rocky made the slightest the slightest bit of difference uh last one daniel asks what effect if any has the u.s demand for items like k31 diopter sites had on availability in switzerland a person for switzerland sells um sites sets continually fetching 300 to 400 dollars on ebay auctions uh i mean i don't think at the gun shows i've noticed a change in the price not that no. i've been looking because i have a i have a second set i don't use um <laughs> Mine. <laughs> um, even though I don't use it. Um, but a gun shows you're looking sort of 140, 150 Swiss francs. It's almost yeah. one to one. With Online, the so the, the Swiss version of eBay, they go for the same, so 300. 300 francs is about the, yeah. the maximum. In gun shops, they go for about that yeah. as well. And sometimes you can buy them with a rifle attached. Yeah, them with a rifle yeah the, attached the issue is you, you, can, you, can, you, buy this, you can buy it with a rifle attached for 400. So. You're basically buying the sights and getting a free rifle. Yeah, you get a free Even the rifle's wrecked. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Just take it off. Leave it somewhere. Yeah. So that is basically it. Um, I apologise if anyone sent one after I printed this off, which was quite a while ago. So it's entirely possible. Um, if you've fallen through the gaps there, please, next time we do There'll one of these, one. Yeah. there will be another one. Just repose the question and mea culpa. Uh, life's been it's a excellent bit like timing, that. by the way. Absolute timing. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> why don't you crack open another one while I say thank you very much to patrons for providing the questions. Um, if you're not a patron already and would like to support the stuff and nonsense we get up to here on the channel, um, I would. Well, we would both be very, very grateful. Uh, it helps us a lot. Uh, we've been doing this almost six years now, which is kind of crazy. Goodness me. Yes. <laughs> 
So, celebratory pair of beverages. So, you have a me? Chinook India Pale Ale. Okay. I think it's it's a fake American. Kraft Beer Werkstatt, <laughs> Germany. Okay. Ooh, 6.2. Nice. And I have a Salon Hungarian something. Tobe Mint 110 EV something. Nice. So, yeah, this German take on a... In IPA. On an American IPA. This is very malty, strangely. This is very... There's a, there's a nice expression that's not coming to mind, which is like, why have the fake when you can have the real thing? <laughs> I'm not surprised. This is, this, is, this is strange. This is slightly sweet, very malty, despite it looking like a pill. Pisswasser. Yeah. It's... <laughs> It's got more body than you expect. Yeah. Hmm. So anyway, thank you very much for putting up with us our stuff and stuff and nonsense. <laughs> thank you very much to my What Would Stoner Do and uh, Norinko <laughs> 1980s Type 56S for holding up the microphone. Yep. Uh, hope the sound quality's been okay and there's not been too much sofa noise. Well, it's not a very squeaky sofa. It's all right. No. Ooh. Ooh. Bruce and, uh, Anyway, thank you very much. We'll just shut up now and uh, drink some more beer. So see you again sometime. Bye. Bye.